seeing uh, the bulk uh, fall. And I've actually done that in the uh, Ottawa club in the past. I bought uh, like a, th a package of a thousand hooks uh, of a certain kind. And, um, and then people just paid a little bit to get a, a, a chunk of them because uh, I mean, it was a huge difference in price. Oh yeah, immense difference. So yeah. let's get things kind of set up here. So, I don't know how well this works here. I gotta get my light so you can see a little better. So you can see this This one is the body has been tied with a, this is the first one I'm gonna tie. It's been tied with a combination of that uni mohair. And to add a little flash to it, I'm using a rib of straggle string, which uh, which this stuff is, is called black but it's actually got a little bit of a purple color to it. And it's got, it, it's got quite a bit of glisten to it. So the difference between the first fly and the second fly is, this one is just tied without the straggle and it's a fairly plain body. And you can see there's a little bit of fuzz in there, but not a whole lot. And then this one, I tied it a little bit different technique and that got a, a, bit, a bit fuzzier body. Um, but I decided I would try something that had some long fibers in it. So I, I got some Angora goat in the purple color. And you can see with that dubbed on how fuzzy that body is. And, and yet it's still pliable enough that when you strip it, it's going to skinny right down. So that's the idea behind tying the same fly with two different body materials. So you'll see what the difference is. Uh, and I think, the, I think the dubbed body is a little closer to what uh, Phil did with his regular mohair. Dave, have you worked with llama hair? A little bit. Does it compare uh, with any mohair uh, and your goat? Yeah, I think llama hair would be pretty similar to, to, to um, the Angora goat in a lot of ways. A few, so years ago, a few years ago, I was in Manitoba at a farmer's market and I ran into a, a lady that was trying to pedal, pedal it. And so she yeah. gave me a few different, I got four different colors and I'm just, well, having a little trouble making, making leech patterns out of it, to, uh, making it work. Well, we'll have to talk to Dennis. Maybe he can tell you how to tie his llama leech. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, um, it's good, good for... Um... Chum flies. Yeah. Okay. Especially if you got chartreuse in it. No. Nope. Yes. This is this is more uh, nature colors: red, brown, oh, okay. grays. Uh... Yeah. So anyway, the, 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 this this pattern we're starting with a, a I'm using a size six hook mostly for hooking ability and for a reasonably long shank with a little bit of weight to it. Uh, thread is uh, eight aught olive. Um, I'm weighted, so I've got a little bit of uh, lead wire here, a lead free wire, and I'm just going to start by putting the wire on the on the hook. I'm going to try and get six or six or eight wraps of, I think it's 025 wire, and I'm going to wrap that down there, nice tight wraps all the way around. I'm going to use my fingernail to stick the bottom, the, the tag end in there and get the other end the same way. <coughs> Trying to get the lead wire right tight to the hook. And I'm going to put that, place that lead wire two eye widths or so back of the, the head of the hook. So the heavier wire hook and the lead wire will, will allow this thing to sit on the bottom of a strike indicator uh, without too much slack in the drop. I'm gonna start the thread right behind the eye. And then I'm gonna hold that wire in place and wrap over top of it so that I get a little bit of thread 
in between the wraps of wire and then a little bit in behind. And then to make the body a little smoother when I'm wrapping the body forward, I'm gonna build a little ramp of thread at the back end of the lead wire. So you can see I've got a little bit of a ramp there between the hook and the and the lead. And I'm gonna do go up front and I'm gonna do the same thing there. Build a little lamp, ramp of thread just to bury the rough end of the lead and to make the transition to the hook nice and smooth. Now I'm gonna take this uh, uni mohair <clears throat> just in behind the uh, eye of the hook right before the before the lead starts, the weight starts, and I'm going to wrap that, <clears throat> and I'm going to wrap over top of that. And I'm going to stop there, wrap it all the way back to the back of the hook. And I'm going to try and capture the end of this in the spool so it doesn't completely unravel on me. And then I'm going to take this draggle fritz, come up the hook shank, and I'm going to wrap that down on top. I'm going to take that back to the bend of the hook. I'm going to do the same thing with that thing. I'm going to capture it so I don't have to cut it off the cut it off the spool just yet. Hang it in the material clip. Bring my thread forward. And again, the joys of a rotary vise. I'm going to tie a half hitch here right at the eye of the hook. And I'm going to get my thread out of the way. And now I'm going to take this mohair and I'm going to wrap it over the back of the hook, tie things down. And then I'm going to, uh, I figured that was going to happen. So what the heck with that. Didn't stay where it was supposed to. So I'm going to wrap this. Come out of there. I want to keep that out of the way. I'm going to wrap this uh, mohair in fairly loose spiral. I'll darn that. I should have kept that a little longer. Maybe I can get the material there, material could hold it. And I'm gonna not tight together, and a little bit of an open spiral up to where the lead is, about, and then I'm gonna wrap back. And I'm doing this multiple wraps because as you can see, there's not a lot of no hair sticking out of that. A little bit fuzz, but not a whole lot. Not this you could time. brush some, couldn't you, Dave? Well, that's the next step is to uh, to try and brush some out. Just so happened that this part of the spool didn't have a lot of mohair on it. So now that now it's getting a little thicker. I'm going to get that up to the front. And I'm going to tie that down two or three wraps, pull it back, a couple of wraps over top of it, trying to maintain a little bit of a gap between the bulky part where the lead is and the eye of the hook. I'm gonna take my draggle string and do an open wrap rib up the body. And tie that off in front of the lead. A couple of wraps there, a couple of wraps up front. Trim it off. And this is where your suggestion comes in. I'm going to take my little Velcro on a stick and I'm going to pick at this thing. Now you see it's pulling those 
trap fibers from multiple wraps of thread out and making the body fairly fuzzy. You see, it's it's not really fuzzy, but it certainly was fuzzier than than the string was by itself. And it's also pulled out a few of those bits of the straggle string as flash, and gives a little glisten to the body. Okay. Now the next step is to put the hackle on. Let's get this stuff out of the way before I stand on it. There go. Okay. So now what you do is you take your pheasant rump fiber, feather. So this is the way it comes off the, the skin. And you'll see there's a lot of uh, fluzz on the bottom half of the stem. There's also a little feather at the back here when you pick it off. These are the phyllo plumes. And there's a couple of patterns that use these as a head material, the, the sparrow is one. And that's where that comes from, is it comes from the after shaft on the pheasant rump. So what you do with this feather, once you get the after shaft off, is you pick one, pick a feather that's got barbules that run the full length of the hook and hang out the back a little bit. So that when you wrap this, the, the, the barbules from the pheasant rump are gonna extend a little pat past the bend. And then what you do is you, you strip off all this fuzz from the bottom off the, off the stem of the feather, like that. That's the start of the prep. And I've got, I've got a better feather here for that's already been done. So that's, you can see that the barbules are now, for this guy, are past the bend of the hook a reasonable amount. So then what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna hold it by the very tip and I'm gonna strip or stroke these feathers the wrong way so that they stand out at right angles to the shaft of the feather. And I'm, you see, I'm gonna end up with a, a little, V section here where they still have feathers go on the right day and where the barbules go the other way. I'm going to turn that around so that the nicely colored side of the feather faces me and the dull side faces the hook and the little remaining feathers at the front. And where that, that V is, I'm going to set that down on the hook where my thread is right in front of the lid, right at the front of the, where the lid was. And I'm gonna wrap a couple or three good wraps in there to cinch it down. Then I'm gonna pull the tip up and wrap over those a bit and hold them in place. Get my scissors in there and just trim that tip off. Give another good wrap. Now I have attached by the tip and I've got the, all these feathers so that the, all the barbules face the brightly colored side faces the front of the hook. And I'm gonna take my hackle pliers and grab the stem, wet my fingers and stroke all these barbules towards the rear. So you can see that they're in effect folding around the stem. And then I'm going to do a wrap around the shank of the hook. And every time I go underneath the hook, I'm going to stroke these fibers back so that they come free of the shank. Do the same thing for two. And if you pick a, enough of them, a good feather, you're going to get three and maybe four wraps. And I'm going to tie that bare shaft now over top of the hook. I'm going to get three really good wraps on him. And then I'm going to wrap in front. 
patent in the shaft node. I'm going to take my fingers and form a little V and pull them carefully back past the eye to sweep all of those pheasant rump fibers towards the rear, nicely spaced all around the hook shank. And I'm going to build a little dam of thread, pushing those fibers back and keeping them there and leaving a good eye width, maybe a little more between where they're tied down and the eye of the hook. And that forces those fibers to be facing the back. The next thing I'm going to use is peacock sword. This comes off of the eye of the end of the peacock feathers. And you see these nice little ragged finish to those. I'm going to take two of those that are long enough to reach from the eye of the hook back to the bend. Pull them off the shaft. And I'm going to lay them over top of that body with the hackle or top of the hackle and cinch them down good. Make sure they're right on top. And again, because this is a rotary vise, I'm going to turn them upside down. But before I do that, I need to trim those tips out. Then I'm going to take two more. Take them off the shank and lay them on the underside and wrap them down. Wrap in front of the two butts and trim them off just to lock them in. Make sure they're good solidly wrapped there so that they're now streaming back the same way that the pheasant rump is. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a single strand of peacock curl, kind of wrap it around the thread, take it up and tie it down on the hook shank. Then I'm going to wrap that peacock curl around the thread two or three times. And then I'm going to make a little head of peacock curl. When I got four or five wraps of that, then I'm going to just take the tips of the peacock curl out of the way and cinch them down and trim them off. Wrap in front, wrap behind to lock them in, and then trim the bits up. You can't, if you, if you, crowd the eye with the lead and everything, then you won't be able to do that. So you want to leave that gap between the lead and the eye. Whip finish. And two for good measure. And that's fly number one. So that came out okay. So now you can see it's, you can see the profile of the body under there. It's got a little bit of flash, a little bit of fuzz, and the pheasant rump makes a shrouded body. And all this stuff is nice and soft so that when it's stripped through the water, it'll skinny down to a very fine profile. And you'll have some color contrast in there. Hopefully a fish will like it. So when I discovered that I didn't have as fuzzy a mohair, I decided there, were, there needed to be an alternative. So I went and I got myself some long fibered natural material that I'm going to dub a body with. And that this is this stuff, Angora goat. 
and the, the blood leech that uh, Phil tied was a mauve or a purple color. So I got some purple. And the first couple that I tied with the purple, I found the purple was pretty intense color. <laughs> so I figured I'd better adulterate it a little bit. So what I've done is I've got some purple and I've got some brown. So I got some fibers out of each and I mixed them all together, pulled them all apart, put them together and made a, a fuzz ball of mix between purple and brown. Still nice and purple, but it's a toned down a bit from the other one. This one, because this has lots of fuzz, oh, oh where'd that go? <laughs> I'm gonna to have to search for my hook in a minute. But, uh, it's surprising how far a hook will bounce on carpet. <laughs> oh well, I'll find it later. I have a pair of magnetic scissors that will do the job for me. So this is a, uh, a nice long shank. This is actually a 3X long shank, size six. He barbed. Put in the vise. Locked in so it's not going anywhere. Okay. Now it's going to be the same general approach. I'm going to take the wire again and start back here with six or eight wraps. Pinch it off with my fingernails, about the right length. And again, squish all of the wraps together, use my fingernails to make sure that Cut ends are nice and tight. Would it ride differently in the water with a cone head or a bead rather than the yeah, because it'd be quite hefty. Uh, and and th so this this lead lead free wire is not that heavy, but it adds a little that that, that gets the uh, the fly down better and keeps some of the slack out of the dropper. That's that's the key. Um, the thread this time is a claret or wine colored thread, not red. It's purple. And I'm going to start here in front and always with these uh, standard downturned eyes, I always do a few wraps right behind the eye because there's a little gap there uh, where they bend the eye around it. And if you don't fill that gap and you're using a light tippet, uh, sometimes the tippet will get caught in that gap and it'll cut it. So I always try to fill that little gap with thread before, and I only do it on these these hooks that have an eye that doesn't close up quite right. So again, I'll build this little ramp at the back. And at the front. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap thread all the way down what we call dress the hook, which is almost touching, if not touching wraps all the way back down the shank of the hook to where the barb was. And I'm going to get my dubbing spinner which in my case is a, a weighted one with little hooks on it. And I'm gonna make a big dubbing loop. It's uh, probably about five, five inches long, four or five inches long. Bring the thread up and wrap it around the shank of the hook and then pass it un under, sorry, over and under, over and under the two threads and then give it another wrap. What does this is that closes the loop at the one end. 
I'm going to take my thread forward and right to the eye of the hook. Use my half hitch tool, tie the half hitch off. Ah, get on. Come on. There we go. Get on there. Boy, I'm having trouble with this purple thread. There we go. And then bring my bobbin out of the way. One of the problems with letting that spinner sit there that way is it kind of wound up the dubbing loop. So I'll have to see if I can unwind that. Tends to wind itself up if I let it go. <laughs> there you go. So now I got my dubbing loop open all the way up. And now I'm going to take my very fibrous dubbing and I'm going to slide little bits of it into the dubbing loop and shove them up to the top. Little clumps of it. About this, try to keep them relatively even in size and get it into that dubbing loop where it's uh, about the same amount in each clump and sticking out about the same amount either side of the, the loop. So it's a little bit finicky. And, and as I get to the bottom, I can cinch up on the dubbing loop a bit to keep the fibers in there by pulling on the, the weight. And when I get a good four or five inches worth of doubling loop filled with material and distribute it on there reasonably evenly, I'm going to let it hang down and I'm going to spin the daylights out of it. That's the beauty of these, uh, these dubbing spinners is that uh, you can get a really nice rope. I'm just gonna massage it a little bit, spreading the material out a little bit better. Give it another spin. Okay. Now the trick is to, uh, is to make a nice even body out of this. So again, with the rotary vise, I can and spin this and wrap it forward. Now you see, because of all, this is a long fiber material, it makes a very, very fuzzy body. And there's lots of material in there for me to pick out in a minute. So when I get to where the weight is, I just get to the front of the weight and we'll do the same thing as before. A couple of wraps over top. Pull the loop back, a couple of wraps in front, and then trim the loop off. Now this is real fuzzy material. So I can take my Velcro and make it even fuzzier. But what I'm doing is mostly stroking this backwards. So there's a nice, very fuzzy body. And that'll make a, a little difference in how the pheasant rump sits around the hook. Now you could make it a little sparser if you want, but I'd like it, I wanted to do this fairly, fairly fat. Okay, so now we get my next pheasant rump. And I have one here that's that's got nice long fibers. You can see it's gonna go the full length of the hook shank. Gonna 
hold it by the, I've already prepped this feather, so I hold it by the tip. Stroke the, uh, the long fibers back until I have about a shank length worth of, of barbules sticking out to the side. Again, intense color side facing me. Put that tip down in front of the eye and go over the V, cinch her down. Pull that tip up, wrap it in front, hang on to it, cinch it out, snip it out. Get my hackle pliers again and do this folded hackle thing. This is a really good technique to learn. This, this will help if you practice with pheasant rump, it'll make tiling, tying those traditional English wet flies with partridge and, and grouse a whole lot easier because you'll develop the, the skill for doing this folded hackle technique to the point where you'll take the barbules off of one side of the feather and you only use half of the barbs. Choking them back. Okay. Tie that stem down. And wrap in front again to lock that stem in. When I go in here and trim these, I'm just barely closing the scissors. I'm just almost using the edge of the scissor blade to, to snip it rather than actually snipping out. And that saves you cutting through things that you don't want to cut. All right, now, peacock sword. Same process as the last time. A couple of strands of peacock sword. I'm gonna lay over top of all that. Tie them off. Back in front. Trim. Turn it over. Two more. Over top, under the bottom side by the hook point. And those guys got a little bit short. I need to get them out there and trim them. And then again, a single strand of Peacock curl, wrapped around the thread, get it cinched down on the eye, two or three wraps around the thread, and then hold them at the joint there and do wraps around the hook shank to make a nice fuzzy, short fuzzy head. And then when I tie these down, this time they tied down sort of at the rear of the head. So when I trim these out, and then when I want to wrap the thread forward to do the whip finish, I want to kind of wiggle the thread through the peacock curl a little bit so it doesn't mat it down. Get right behind the eye and I'll whip finish. one and then the second one for good, good measure and again just use the edge of the scissors to cut that thread and that's in you can see it's got a that purple gives it a really nice little glow to it and it helps maintain that that torpedo shape when you when you stroke it through the water, when you pull it through the water. So that's my version of uh, 
the marabou blood leech with no marabou. <laughs> or sorry, the, the, the mohair blood leech with no mohair. It uses angora goat instead. That's really nice, Dave. Thank you. So I've, I've got a handful of those tied now. <laughs> yeah, both of those are nicely tied. I, uh, I think what we should do is we should consider getting a club uh, Angora rabbit. <laughs> well, that, that I'm Angora, in. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this Angora goat package I got at Robinson's for $2.99. Now to tell you how things change, this, this uh, Angora goat was bought from Denny's Fly Tying Specialties, which goes back 20 years or more, hey, Florin? <laughs> and it was a dollar, dollar 60. <laughs> That's inflation. A <laughs> dollar 60 to three dollars, double in about 25 oh, yeah. years. And, <laughs> and you got a lot more in the, in the first batch than you do in the new one. That's right. It's it's uh, more more uh, more more material there. <laughs> Still not as bad as houses. Oh yeah. So, so it's been inflation, but it's not been killer inflation on fly tying materials for some materials. Well, Lauren, your house has probably gone up in value since you owned it quite a bit. Oh, don't tell me because it just drives me nuts. I'm gonna be hit with capital gains tax and whatnot, and you know, like Edmonton is going down and Victoria is going like this. It's I'm only glad that, you know, it's like, I don't have to think about it. It's just, you know, because oh, yeah, when, like, if I were to come today and buy in this market, it would be like, oh, no, thank you. Yeah. Florin, there's a supposed to be a burst in the housing bubble in Toronto and Victoria coming. So there you are. Yeah, everybody's moving to Edmonton and is going to buy up all the Edmonton property, right? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I read all these stories about, oh, you know, everybody's moving to the suburbs, small town life, blah, 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 you know. Well, but the oil bust, you know, it's going to be all turned back into pasture land. <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see about well, that. When you're asking about pheasant rump, you can get them in, in plucked packages like this. This goes back a fair ways away. And then you can get them on the actual skin, like that. So that's that's pheasant run that rump that's still on the skin. I, you know, if you have the preference, I would get it this way, because you have a much better selection of sizes. I actually found some pheasant rump. Uh. I have no this idea where it came from. This is what they call a blue phase pheasant, which has a lot more blue color to it. Anyway. Yeah, I like that blue in the fly. Get a little different tone. Mm -hmm. well, some patterns actually do call for, for that specific one. It's almost like with pheasant rump, you need uh, two or three patches of the stuff, you know, one with the more gray feathers, one with more brown ones, and then uh, at least a dyed one, purple would be a... Well, I've, I've got color. dyed ones in, in green and, and a couple of other colors. And uh, if you're tying carry specials in multiple different colors, uh, having different colored pheasant rump, is really nice because you can get the whole fly to be a, a different color. And I guess for all these uh, exciting flies you were showing earlier, you know, you probably need an orange one too. <laughs> it might be an idea. <laughs> Hot orange, preferably. Or pink. Uh, speaking of which, yeah, um, a zebra midge with a hot spot on it was. Uh, a very exciting fly for me on this trip. So those are- You, really you mentioned tying, uh, tying Don's mountain midge. 
Yeah, that's um, that was that was the other one, and then I had some strange concoction I was playing with. With that, um, I have some pink diamond dub. Mm -hmm. I believe that's what it is. Yeah, some some pink diamond dub looks like this. I'm sure you guys have similar materials. Um, so I was doing like a small midge slash emerger bead head thing with this diamond dub and boy, that worked well too, especially more like in, you know, towards dusk. It's, it's a rather bright, bright contraption that's quite, quite visible in low light conditions. So Mohammed, you're up. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Mohammed, before you start, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> That's marabou, isn't it? Yeah, but it's it's orange. It's huge. I don't know where did I get it, but I have it. <laughs> it's it's like that. So is it usable for what? Absolutely. Oh, it's very good. Yeah. I'd tie that in his tails on any any number of leeches and on woolly buggers for sure. And what do can I fish trout with that? Well, yeah, and you know the other thing that you'd find with that is I would tie, I would tie like a, a size six hook with about a three x long. Yes, this what it is. And tie a woolly bugger with with that as the tail, and and go out fishing for bass at Elk Lake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 can I fish in Prospect? Sure. Okay. And let's uh, try. What kind of line I would use? Sinking line. For for what? For bass? Well, for whatever. Yeah, whichever. Yeah. A type three sink. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for interruption. No problem. I, I, I tied one up with that type of material and I have caught salmon with Atlantic salmon with this fly oh. in heavy water, you know, and it moves. You have to pulsate it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. How many beads on that fly? None. There are no beads. No, no, that's that's the marabou. But no, the Atlantic salmon fly. How many oh. beads did that thing have? Oh, you're muted. We can't hear. You're muted. <laughs> that had two uh, beads on it, a red and a gold, and it was uh, fished in brackish water at the mouth of the river. Uh, both the uh, beads uh, metal or is one glass? Um, the front one was tongues and then the back one was brass. Oh, okay. So both metal and heavy. Yeah, that's a heavy fly. How far apart were the beads? When you're fishing in salt water, it takes a lot more effort to sink. Yeah. Yeah. Salt water is a lot more buoyant. It was actually pretty good on Andy Costi Island too when I fished there. Okay, folks, uh, if there's no more questions, I will get started. Thank you very much. Uh, those were nice uh, ties, um, Dave. Um, so I'm going to be tying the balance leech. This is a full Rowley pattern, and you can see it here. Uh, let me get my little background in, see if that helps make it uh, stand out a bit more. Um, so you can see the marabou tail that uh, even flutters in the uh, slight air movement that's here. It's got a gold bead on the tip and it's a jig hook with a 90 degree bend. So one of the things that um, you see these days are the jig hooks that have like a 45 or 60 degree bend for the slotted beads. And you can't do that. Those will not sit straight um, like a balanced leech, but they do work as well. So 
if you don't want to go through the hassle of uh, tying a balanced leech, uh, the, the slotted beads and the, and the uh, 60 or 45 degree bend hooks definitely work as well. So I'm going to show you, this is a size eight hook right here. And then this one, uh, let's see if I can do this slightly differently. But can you guys see those? So that's a four and an eight. And I also have a size six. And typically I tie these um, in that range. I mean, you could go smaller than that, but um, these hooks that I have are actually light, light wire hooks. They're not very uh, thick at all. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I got a, a deal on these. Uh, I bought uh, packages of a thousand and I uh, shared them with the club when I was in Ottawa. So uh, that's a good way of doing it because the cost is certainly a lot. Sorry to interrupt, but your sound, I don't know if everyone else is hearing. I can barely hear you because it's like got interference. Oh, yeah, I don't okay. Know if the sound is breaking up a bit. Yeah, maybe it's like... I don't know if it's because my iPad and where the, uh, where the mic for it is. Yeah, I think, I think the, it's because the, the position of the iPad. Let me, uh, I'm going to switch to my computer for sound and we will. Okay. 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 Oh. okay. I'm trying to mute. I'm trying to mute my iPad so that. Oh. Okay. This is. Okay. Unfortunately, it seems that. Uh, the iPad is not letting me turn the volume down to zero. Let me. Okay. Jeez. Okay, I'm not sure. This is still on the iPad. I'm not sure if that's uh, that's, that's better. The, yeah. Okay. That's better at this point. Okay. So I showed you the hooks. The materials we're going to use are red thread. Uh, you can also use black. That's not an issue. Uh, and obviously, if you go with a different color. You can go brown, olive, um, choose your color and you can, uh, you can certainly get, have a lot of options in terms of the colors you can go with. There is dubbing, which is uh, sort of a maroon claret color wine. Uh, gold beads, this is a 3 16 inch bead. Um, brass bead and it's got a narrow end and a wide end on the uh, bead. You could also use a cone head if you wanted. Um, certainly uh, another option to go with. And then uh, I showed you the wire and I think that's, those are the main materials. The one other thing you need for this fly is a straight bin and you can sneak into your wife, wife's, uh, wife's um, sewing uh, gear and steal one of her pins. I don't think she'll notice one missing, but if you take a whole bunch, you may have a problem. Now, one of the key things to, to do is when you have the pin, do not use your scissors. Use wire cutters and depending on the length, you can actually buy pins. I've actually seen them online. You can buy like half inch and three quarter inch pins and, and the size of the pin will 
uh, obviously um, factor into the size of fly you're tying as well. But I just use wire cutters and cut those down. And then I put a bead on and you put narrow and forced. And that is what it will look like right there. So this looks like it's not entirely sharp. Okay. Um, I apologize. I'm not sure if I can do much about the, uh, the focus on this thing. Okay. So to start, what I do um, is tie on the thread. And then I will trim off the excess. So now what you do is you take your pin and now this is where once you tie a few of these, you're gonna get the hang of where it needs uh, to be for balancing. And you tie in the pin against the shaft of the hook. And what I recommend is for the first couple, you, uh, you just uh, put a couple of uh, knots in there or you can whip finish it, whichever you want. And then trim off your thread. And then the next thing you're gonna do is you're actually gonna take the hook, you're gonna put either fishing line or wire or something through the eye. And you're gonna check to see how it balances. And what I suggest is you actually balance it so that actually this beads move forward. So uh, move back on the fly. So it's actually leaning slightly uh, back. And what I suggest is if anything, you want it leaning slightly forward because what you can do is you can always put a tiny amount of lead on the shaft to balance it out. And also when you add the materials in, um, you can also adjust, uh, they'll add a slight amount of weight, not a lot, but they'll add a slight amount of weight to counteract that. So I'm just trying to wiggle this slightly forward. Okay. And again, in the end, it's not, critical because remember when you're fishing these you're typically fishing them uh, below an indicator and if you have any kind of movement on the water these things are going to be bouncing up and down anyways so it's not going to be um, stationary for the most part unless it's a dead calm day in which case you're going to be moving that fly slightly every once in a while so now that we've got it where we want it you just go and wind down the whole shaft of the pin to get it um, locked onto the hook shank. And I'm just whip finishing it on to lock that on. And then what I typically do at this point is I will take um, either resin or head cement or something, and I will actually um, coat the threads so that it sort of secures it in a bit better. UV resin is, is going to obviously do a little bit better job or even super glue maybe will, will lock it in a little bit better. And, uh, and then you can move down. Now, one of the things to be careful about is that uh, the tip of the pin where you, uh, the end of the pin where you cut it, 
uh, is going to be slightly sharp. So just be careful with that tip. And by the way, if anyone has questions, don't hesitate to ask. So bring the thread down. The benefit of using the, the, of the small pins comes in because if you buy the yeah the one small pins, then you you avoid that sharp corner there. That's, yeah, that's yeah, you don't have that. I uh, buy them uh, full edge. Yeah, uh, I. I I mean, they're not cheap when you're buying them because I've seen them on um, on eBay uh, in the fly fishing stuff. Uh, and they have, I think, half inch and three quarter inch that I've seen. And uh, they're not cheap. You don't get a lot of uh, pins, whereas you go to the fabric store or the sewing store and you can get uh, a huge box of pins for like, so I don't know, three, four dollars. So <laughs> there's a big yeah, difference. I, but, I get mine. Uh, at yeah, the you fabric can buy store. those for sure. There, it's just that they're called sequin pins. Right. Yeah, sequin pins. They're quite and, short. And oh, and they're, okay. they're quite they're they're long enough to do flies in the kind of that medium range, you know, sizes 10, 8, uh, 12. Oh, okay. If you wanna go down to 14, you have to cut. If you wanna go to size bigger than eight, I think they might start to get a little short. Yeah. But in that that's right. Eight to twelve range, the sequin pins. Yeah, I I wouldn't buy the fly shop ones. They're yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, you buy a lifetime supply for a few bucks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're, they're okay, cheap, and you can get them either gold or silver. You know, I have both colors. I think. Oh, okay. I I I haven't been in a fabric store in a while. I didn't realize you could get uh, sequin pins that were yes. that length. So that's perfect. That's, that's so, what you need to look for. I've got my, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you, uh, Florent. Okay, so now I'm gonna take some of my marabou here and I'm gonna strip off a clump. And actually I got more than I planned, but uh, I have to trim off the little bit of butt from the um, shaft of the marabou that, uh, is quite, uh, has pulled off. Okay, there we go. So now you take your marabou and tie it on as your tail. And this stuff is spinning around the hook, so you just have to keep it under control. Yeah, marabou tends to rotate around the hook very easily. I find if uh, I happen to wound down the thread all the way down to the base, so. There you go. So that's your tail. And now we're gonna take a little piece of wire. Um, and I am going to tie in the wire that's going to be used for the ribbing. And what I like to do is I, I bring the wire so that it butts up to the uh, end of the pin. And not that it matters too much because once you dive in, you won't even notice a slight difference in, in thickness. Okay, so that's in place. Now we are gonna form a dubbing loop the same way that um, Dave had done a short while ago on his fly. And I have the same type of dubbing spinner that he has. I think it was the same. So you just loop it around. And again, I'm gonna make it about four to five inches long. Bring it back. Do the same thing as Dave, go in behind and in front to lock in that loop. And then now 
I take a little bit of my my wine uh, claret uh, colored uh, dubbing. Oh, actually, I'm going to put a little bit of wax on my on my dubbing loop as well. Now, one of the other things that I've used, I've got this wax, but one of the other things that I used uh, one time when I was here in Victoria, but living in Ottawa, is I used um, the glue sticks. And these actually work surprisingly well, and they're quite sticky to make a little um, uh, stickiness on your thread to, uh, to put in your material so that they adhere on there. Okay. I'm going to put a tiny bit more up at the top here. Okay, and then I'm going to spin. Okay, so there we go. So now I'm going to bring my thread forward and bring it down. You can actually bring it in front of the eye all the way up to the brass bead. And in fact, you can even wrap in front of uh, or behind the bead to uh, lock it in a little bit. And then now you can tie in or wind up your dubbed loop to start forming your body. and wind it forward, trying to keep it as uniform as you can. And I'm a little bit short, so I will have to come back and add a little bit more dubbing. So a few wines over the uh, doubling loop and you can cut it off and I'll have to form another doubling loop. So now we'll do a second doubling loop. And you can always go thin on the doubling loop. It's not a big deal because um, as you, uh, you can um, always wrap more. And you can um, even out your body because if you tie it sparsely, you can always go over it and double, double up on, um, on your uh, wrapping over the, the shaft. Okay, so now a little bit more dubbing again uh, for some wax. Okay, there we go. And you keep adding the dubbing. I've gone a little bit thicker on this one. I usually don't go quite this thick, but you can tease it out with the uh, dubbing brush as well. 
Okay, so let's spin that down again. Okay, and there we go. We've got our dubbing loop again. And wrap it forward. Oh, that worked out just nicely. So, and there you go. That is the body all dubbed and wrapped. Okay, so now what we'll do is we will take our rib and whether you choose to counter wrap it or wrap it in the same direction, it's not a big deal. Uh, you could also go gold or silver on this. Um, I think the one that Phil Rowley had tied was um, sort of red on the, on the wine color, but certainly gold or silver would also work fine. And you come forward of the of the jig eye and then tie it in behind the bead. A couple of wraps in front and behind. And cut off the material, and that is essentially the fly. I will whip finish. And I will trim off my thread. And then I will get my dubbing brush. And this is my fancy one that I had made when I first started out into fly fishing. It's got, it's a wooden dowel with a flattened end for the Velcro on one end and the other end is tapered with a little loop for, uh, I'm trying to remember what I had used this for, but um, it did come in handy for certain things. And I haven't used that in a while, but And there you go. That's your fuzzy purple or wine colored balanced leech. Mohammed. Yes. How is that fished? Yes, Bill. How is it fished? Sorry, repeat that. How, how do you uh, fish this, it? You typically are fishing. Uh, yeah, Under, this is this is typically fished below an in below an perfect. indicator um, okay. on, on flat water. You wouldn't typically use this on a river because um, it's really not. Uh, it's you are probably going to cause it to dig in a little bit uh, on the bottom. And sometimes that may work, but I think a more traditional uh, leech pattern um, without the jig look is probably gonna work better. Or the patterns that have the new slotted beads in that, that have the angled head, um, that would probably work better on a river. But this, this works great under an indicator uh, on flat water. Okay, thank you. Uh, great job. I work with this on streams too. You're welcome. Also fished under an indicator. Sorry, or without, you've used just on a, and and in fact, it it turns out that if if it's reasonably well balanced and it's it has to be a little bit tip heavy on a on a river, yes. I found. And the problem of digging in actually doesn't doesn't happen 
Now my my hooks are either forty oh. fives or sixty degrees. I haven't tried with ninety degrees. Maybe that's different with the ninety degree. But it's it's worth experimenting with this on a stream too. This is what what I'd like to say. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a fair point. That's a good idea. I mean, give it give it a you never know what's try. Good. and and in fact, what I what I started to like doing is if I'm fishing a portion of a stream where there are boulders and all kinds of snaggy nasties, I put one of these things on rather than a regular tied streamer. Okay. And I would actually be tempted to tie some streamers on these balance hooks rather than, than on the standard. The only disadvantage that I can see and I've experienced is that the way the fly is tied, it just gives the fish a little more leverage. So you're more likely to lose fish with a, yes. with a balanced leech on a stream than, than with a regular streamer. But in terms of fishing snaggy water, this is a really nice, nice thing to use because those rocks on the bottom, you know, the, the head, you know, like you put a colored bead and the paint is going to wear off eventually. Yeah. But you're not going to lose that many flies as you would otherwise. That's true. So yeah. It's, it's a great pattern. Yeah. No, this is definitely a, a good pattern. And I, I know I've seen um, Phil Rowley and uh, Brian Chan and actually even uh, Don uh, Freshy. Uh, use this quite a lot in still water fishing on uh, a lot of his episodes. So it's definitely a fly worth trying out on uh, lakes. And as Flora said, it doesn't hurt to try it out on a stream because uh, it may just uh, do the trick some days, especially when it's like fish are a little uh, foraging down in the bottom and sort of uh, going through the, the bottom salt and spitting up a little bit of dirt here and there. It may actually uh, be quite attractive. Could potentially be used for coho as well. Mm -hmm. I would think. They yeah, might. actually, I wouldn't be surprised, especially if you uh, if you go uh, to the bigger size um, hooks. This is this is an um, a four, I said, and I've tied it up to. I only have jig hooks in four, six, and size eight, uh, mm -hmm. but I do have some of the uh, other style. Or the slotted beads that go down smaller. Yeah. Hmm. Could you try balancing that? But yeah, sir. Could you take it out and balance? Show how it. Yeah, balances? we can. Yep. Absolutely. Let me. I'm just going to put the thread through the eye, and we will see how that looks. So that's so it could the bead could actually be slightly more forward, and it would be a little more tip heavy, but uh, certainly if it's uh, fishing under an indicator, this is going to be bouncing up and down, and you're yeah. going to get the the movement, and certainly with a marabou, it's going to be uh, a great uh, great fly. Mm -hmm. Looks good. And again, in olive, brown, black, uh, I, you can go crazy with the colors. Certainly, there's lots of choices. Great. So yeah, this is other, other than so. If you're gonna if you're gonna get into tying these, I suggest after you tie one or two, you may want to if you decide you want to tie a whole bunch. I would actually do the. Um, the pin and the bead on the hook and um, use super glue or something and do a bunch of those before I actually tie them up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and make sure that they're balanced. And obviously the if you like them. Yeah. This is a yeah. good flight to do production exactly. time. You can because tie again, dozens of the darn things at one time. And dubbing brushes are the other oh, thing. Yeah. If you have a device to do dubbing brushes, you just do your dubbing in all the colors you want ready-made. You prepare the hooks, exactly. like you said, Mohammed, and then the assembly is just like, you, you take the prepared hook, you put the dubbing brush on, and, and on those, you don't even need the wire rib. 
That's right. The, yeah. If you do a wire brush, because the ribbing is kind of, it's, it's sort of built in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and obviously if you, if you tie like this, this one here is on a size eight and you can see the bead on this one is, uh, is smaller. Um, but obviously you will, you, and, but the other thing that I've seen, I think I actually saw Davy McPhail uh, do it on, uh, I, I don't remember which pattern it was, but he tied a whole bunch of them all with different bead sizes from a small to like quite a large bead for the size of the hook. So there's no rule that says you have to go with a small bead when you're tying a smaller pattern. Um, in some cases, especially if you wanna go deeper and stay down in the water, um, putting a slightly bigger bead on doesn't hurt. Yeah, and you actually, you have room on the, on the pin. So they you can you can add a, a drop of lead there if you want extra weight. So you can either use tungsten, which is already very heavy, and balances forward, or you can yeah. use brass, which is lighter, and add a bit of lead to balance it a little bit That's different. Right. You can you can play with that too. There yeah. Are endless variations. Yeah, and that's the thing. If you if you tie up a bunch of the uh, the hooks with the with the pin and uh, bead and check the balancing, as you say, you can add the weight uh, in front of the, the eye up against the, the bead head to make it a little more tip heavy uh, quite easily. Or if it's the other way around, you can always add a little bit on the shank of the hook to balance it out uh, the way you want. So you've got more flexibility when you do that. Yeah, and, and the other thing is in terms of size, size uh, when you buy jig hooks, you have to pay attention. Some of them are shorter shanks, some of them are longer shank, depending on the manufacturer. And the overall size of the fly. So you take a size eight hook and you think you're tying a size eight fly. But if you have one of the longer shank hooks, like the Daiichi makes a longer shank jig hook, yeah. uh, and you tie that thing, it comes definitely looking like a hefty size six fly. Yes, that's right. Because you're adding a lot of length with the pin, you know. Yeah. yeah. If you go to, um, I think there is a Canadian Lama sells a shorter shank, about half the cost of the Daiichi. It's called a pro tire hook, whatever. And the yeah. tongue hook is also a shorter shank hook. And there you can get a size eight, okay. more like what you think a size eight ought to be. So also kind of pay That's attention right. to, the, uh, to the sizing on these things. Yeah. Which, so which there's the either. two different sizes. The, the hooks that I have are an eagle claw. Um, that's the... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I find these are fairly... Um, uh, hooks they're not a very uh, heavy hook so it's fairly light and um, they're just the standard shank length they're not uh, a long shank at all so you definitely uh, that was a good point about uh, depending on the brand you'll get different uh, lengths but you can see how adding the pin makes the uh, the whole uh, hook look much longer than it actually is Yeah. Yeah, that's why I started to use when I tie these things because I don't want, I want the ratio between the gap of the hook and the shank to be more like a wide, wide gap hook if I can. That's why I've started to yeah. actually look for these. A guy at the club here in Edmonton showed me these shorter shank hooks and I was like, oh, okay, wow, that's a good idea. So I, I tie those on usually on size 10. And you'll notice that the, the size 10 jig hooks tend to be the sold out ones. Oh yeah, okay. Most of the time. Mm -hmm. 